Uh, we got, we hey, got Gerald here. here. Uh, Gerald's here. Hey, what's up, Gerald? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can you. hear you. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, it really sucked on Saturday. I was, I was kind of ticked off myself. It was nobody's fault. It just happened. But no, nah, it happens, dude. Don't worry I, about I think, it. You know what? Honestly, I think it was my fault. I pulled a dumb dumb move. Well, I pulled two <laughs> dumb dumb moves. Okay. Usually, I back my stuff up all the time, but I was in a hurry and I was rushing that day. I wasn't thinking anything of it. Didn't yeah. back it up. And the second dumb dumb move, I think I wiped it out myself somehow. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Hey, I've done, I've done that too. You know, you're in a hurry or you're, you're, you know, feeling some kind of anxiety because you're about to give a big presentation and yeah. you, know, you make mistakes. That's okay though. I have all my notes and I have my uh, editing file. So putting them back together won't be a, a issue. But mm -hmm. now this on Sunday, I was doing some experiments and I had another breakthrough and that actually completes my work. So really? Yes, it nice. completes my theory when it comes to the pyramids and how they work and operate. Oh, nice. So I can't I, wait to hear about that. Yeah, I don't want to get too much into it because I'm going to make it part of the presentation, right? Oh, hmm. come on. You, you're talking about pyramids. <laughs> you got a little bit? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you my theory on the pyramids. How about okay, that? Yeah, there you go. Sure. Hey, I'll take except that. for the last little bit that I'm still working out the details on, but I can give you a pretty good general. So... The pyramids are built on top of an aquifer, and that aquifer is made out of a piezoelectric crystal. So when the pyramids were in their glory days, the River Nile was really close to the front. Mm. And when the moon waxed and waned, the water would, of course, recede and, and come back in, right, with the tides. Mm -hmm. So when the, the water would come back in, it would fill up the aquifer and put pressure on that piezoelectric crystal, causing tons of voltage release. Wow. And because of the way that the pyramid is built, it's a big, giant capacitor, okay? Mm -hmm. And when the water would come up and that voltage would fly upwards, it would go up, and I, pardon me for gapping a little bit of, details in this because like I said I'm working out some things and I recently had to switch something so but the voltage comes up it, it, it gets contained within the whole pyramid itself because the pyramid is encased with a, a, a ceramic insulated stone the granite being part piezoelectric and it rings with sound all that voltage causes the water to break so now you've got hydrogen and oxygen. Mm. There's two shafts that go up at certain angles. And if you look at where those angles are and where they're placed, and they come right up out of the side of the pyramid, one of them would be a hydrogen tube and the other would be oxygen. And I say that because hydrogen and oxygen, when they break and separate, one of um, raises higher than the other. It releases. Oh, so one is denser than the other. Yeah. So I, I'm not using the right term, but you know what I mean? As if right. one's, yeah. So one's lighter than the other. It moves faster than the other. So the, the chamber or the, the, that tube is actually a little lower than the other one on the other side. So do you have any, do you have any ideas what the King's chamber could be? Cause that possibly be a resonance chamber. chamber? It was a sound chamber. So sound when, chamber, yeah. Resonance chamber. Yeah. When all that started to happen, you're going to think when voltage breaks, water there's hmm. sound and it starts to echo right and that echo would vibrate the king's chamber and because of the way that it's built there's like um different tones that go throughout the whole pyramid pushing that energy all the way up now wow there's a couple more uh details that have to be added but as far as i'm aware because of the way that the pyramid worked, the whole base around the pyramid, there was temples that were built in front of the pyramid, behind the pyramid. And these are what the uh, Egyptian priests used. And they had an ankh that would sit hanging on their waist. And everybody thought it was a religious item. Well, perhaps it was, but it, it had a lot more significance than that. So these Geotechnology? Temples, yes, it was. 
It was actually a tuning fork. But it was a special <laughs> tuning fork. Oh, oh man. Okay? So these t these chambers or these temples that were at the base of the pyramid, they had two rooms in it. Uh, and let's say, okay, the, they referred to them as slaves. I don't think they were slaves. I think they had incentive and actually got paid. But I, we won't even go there. That's a just a thought. So uh, one of the slaves, let's say, broke his arm. He'd come to the priest. The priest would go, okay. He'd look at his charts. He'd go, you have to come back at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Because the temple that he would bring them to had slits all around the very top of the temple so that the sun could come in at whatever mm -hmm. angle at that time of day was needed. So at two o'clock, the person would come in, he would sit in the bigger room that was an echo chamber. The priest would go in the smaller room behind him and there was a square that went between both rooms. That's where he put the onk in. And he would smack that sucker and it would vibrate throughout that room. The light coming in would come down at a certain angle hitting the person who sat on that seat and would uh, give them the frequency of light, sound, and here's the beautiful part. Because the pyramid would cause the area all around it to have a negative energy because of the way that it would charge, separate the whole environment, mm -hmm. those people that were sitting in that chair would get enveloped with energy, vibration, like energy, which is vibration, light and, and sound. And what would that do? A broken arm takes about six weeks. When the priest was done with him and he left, three days later, he'd be back to work. Wow. No so arm. do you think this is like uh, using aether, the aether or aether oh, energy? I think, it's, I think it's both. What I think it is is that we have a superhuman healing ability that mm. is within our genetic code within our bodies. And I think it could be activated in times of, say, um, real massive distress. Like, you know how you hear stories of uh wives who have picked up a car because the the jack fell and it fell on their right. husband and they're I not wondering about that about it, right well their yeah. adrenaline kicks in but you've got to understand their adrenaline pumping all that weight and picking it up at the same time they would tear their muscles right off their bones so what actually happens in all of that i'm not sure during but in the after parts i believe that our superhuman healing ability has been activated because of that huge amount of endorphins and adrenaline and energy that got passed through that person at that point and they're healing faster than we'd even know they were hurt wow so, yeah, well, there's i'm sorry go ahead nathan yeah it goes back to some of the temples when you see the people inside the little bell shapes on the top of the temples yeah healing it's the same thing so one other thing at the bottom of the pyramid is the water goes up and it hits the top right there. And when it does that, you're going to get a pulse wave inside that whole pyramid as well. Now, Absolutely. the granite the granite itself contains water. So it, it, it sucks it up like a candle wick into the yep. granite. Yep. And when it rains out there, there's going to be fluoride in it. The fluoride itself actually makes the uh, the quartz in there be able to be more conductive. Really, that yeah. part I didn't know. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. You see the little <laughs> the little barrier around the bottom where they had the water thing that would go up in there. Yep, rainwater. Okay. Well, the other part of the one of the things that I I can actually just bring it up because it, it still has to be proved and shown on video and then. You guys, once I've done my presentation, we're going to work out with a whole bunch of you to confirm or debunk my tech and everything I've learned because I'm going to put a package together. I have 38 coils built now. Wow. Um, I'm going to wow. be building a few more, but there's more to add to that package. There's like tests that I've done, experiments. I have 11 folders of notes, right? So I'm working on how everybody can get sort of where I've been working and how I got to where I am now. And then you can either confirm it or debunk it. Right, to so replicate right? your experiments. Yeah, 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 that's great. I love yeah. it. I, I'm if I don't want it done by universities, I'll tell you that right now. 
I mean, all well, I mean, if you're willing, if you're willing to send me one, I'll definitely do it. Yeah, I'll definitely we'll work here. all that out. I mean, Nathan, you, there's Jeremiah, there's Jeremy, there's um, David Chester. They're like all there's a big group of people that are that are on the list, right? So, um, I'd love to be debunked or or confirmed, but I go debunk first because hey, man, that's what that's the best. That's the best way of confirming someone uh, if they're right. You know yeah, what I mean? I agree. I'll, I'll tell you right now, you're not getting debunked. I know too yeah. much about this to, to yeah. say that. <laughs> well, sure. you know what, Nathan? I got something to tell. I got a story to tell you that I've only told to Jeremiah. And I'm not sure if I should tell it online. <laughs> it's up to you, man. But <laughs> Ask hey, to do it. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to tell you one last thing. Yeah. When you see the Tesla experiments in Colorado, right? And he's yeah. energizing the ground itself. Oh, yeah. That was the other part with water. Okay, go ahead. Now, put that into uh, Egypt. And it was said that back in the day, Egypt was really green. Yes. So I have I a question. You why. Just I'm like, walking out of my seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nathan. I was going to say, just like the rod and coil builds, you know, uh, can do the energy in the earth to grow things faster. Do you think, okay, my opinion is yes, but do you think that they were using this thing as well in order to take a desert and transform it into something green over a ah. bigger area with the aquifers in the in the area? Terraforming. Boom! That's okay. like huge. Dude, that's part of the research that I came across, right? And on Sunday... I proved something to myself that just, that's why it's got to be part of the research. Okay, so what you're saying is absolutely true. Now, remember what we said about the water and the river now going up and down, right? Well, when charge separation happens, where does your ground go? Well, I figured out how to use water as ground. And distance is not thus far becoming a problem. Now, if you look at the way that the pyramids are built and how large they are, and how the grounding system would work through the River Nile, all those plants in the, all of the desert under that aquifer would be negatively charged. And because the pyramids have positively charged the whole area, you're talking, those plants are thriving, striving, and just reaching for it. So yeah, I absolutely wow. believe that when the pyramid was running, it was responsible for the River Nile being gorgeous, like clean as a, you can imagine. And I believe that the desert was like the garden of Eden because of it. I'm not saying wow. it was the garden. I'm saying it was like it. This is well, a fascinating check, theory. Check this out. MIT did a study where you could separate salt from water as well. So to have clean drinking water and clear growing water, they're going to need to know that as well. So this could also separate some of that salt that was in the water we see it naturally in when you get into the caves in, in the earth where all the salt is compiled. There's a process going on in there where it's removing salt from the water and put, putting it all in one spot, and the fresh water comes above it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, see, this is all coming together, man. I'm telling yeah. You, I'm there's, a, there's a lot to unpack here with that uh, with that pyramid theory. Um, I have yeah, a there's a lot more detail. I'm sorry to cut you off there. Oh, no, you're fine. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions if you don't mind. Well, that's no problem. I was just going to say there's a lot more details that I have in my theory. I'm just, you kind of caught me off guard, and I'm really excited <laughs> to kind of get it out because this last, this was the last piece of the puzzle I needed. But, sure. but I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 it's fine. I, I can tell you're excited. I'm excited. It's a, a very interesting theory, and I'd love to hear more. Um, So... Uh, it, regarding the pyramid shape, uh, or the pyramids, is it just the shape itself that uh, is enabled the charge separation to happen? No, the, it's the all of the, it's all of the above. It's a dynamic. All of the above. Stuff. Yeah, you couldn't have one or two or three uh, benefits in the system and have it all work. You have to have everything working together like a clock, right? Mm. Every gear, every it all has to click, but once you turn it on, it's in pretty much indestructible and could run forever. So right. I, got, no. I got a question for you, a little bit of theory. Yep. Terrence Howard came out with that shape, right? 
and we look at the pyramid, we understand that it has six, uh, excuse me, eight sides, not four. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the concave. Yeah. So, let's ask the question Was he partially right in the shape of it because he gave his shapes that same number? I would say partially right, but Terrence Howard unfortunately pulls from too much different information that doesn't connect. Right. He tries to connect it in a way where it's like, um, I don't know how to put that without insulting him. And I don't want to, because I think he's smart. I think he's, mm. he's on to something. I just think that he's pushing too far as to connecting everything all into his theory. The, well, the well, he doesn't, of, he doesn't explain ahead. how he gets from one side to the other. Yeah. Without the connection. That's a big yeah. missing point, right? Yeah. It's like the missing link between like, uh, my red flag with Matt, parents, Howard, me, but you know, my red flag with Terrence Howard is he describes vortex math without saying it's vortex math or giving any kind of indication what it is other than his, you know, own theory. I think Ter Terrence Howard's a lot like a lot of us were in the beginning. We got you think excited. he's just ignorant? He doesn't, he doesn't know about vortex math and this yeah, is just I like him coming just, up with something? I, well, I think he came up with something and he ran with it. And he uh, stuck himself in an echo chamber because he was too worried somebody yeah. was... Yeah, but you, you see, it's interesting. You see that a lot, like different independent people coming up with the same idea yeah. in, in kind of like a wave. Well, now, okay, that also is part of one of the things I've been working on. Man, you just... It goes <laughs> to my theory. It's mind-blowing. Okay, so as as people start to, to come up with the ideas that connect all this tech together... It's more and more people that come up with it independently in different parts of the world. Kind of like the 100 monkey experiment where that one monkey learned how to wash his hands and then they took him out of the pen and the other ones automatically learned how to wash their hands without watching the first hmm. monkey. Wow. So it, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if it's a, psychological thing i don't believe so i believe it's through spirit we're all connected we're all searching for the truth and ultimately yeah. what it comes down to is there's only one line that reaches one point and that truth all the way along the line is how we've all been connecting like what? you get a piece and nathan 100 and you know we're all kind of talking about it and then it's like mm. wow you know what this actually it works out when we put it together but individually Hmm. You, know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things that we're all alive with energy around the world, right? Mm -hmm. And the universe and everything. If we one tap into it, then everybody else can tap into it too. But when we spark it between each other, it comes up like a memory in our mind. Ah. And we're able <laughs> yeah. to expand it. You see what Absolutely. I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's a good way of uh, looking at it. Oh, that's fascinating, guys. Because when I, I know when I get the uh, the understanding of something, it doesn't just come in just a little bit. It becomes real clear within a day or two. I yeah. have every little aspect of this worked out. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, there's a little, there's more to the whole pyramids and and why they work and how they work. and like. I just have a couple more questions with that, if you don't mind. I'd, yeah, go ahead. I'm really, I'm really like, because I did a segment on my own theories of uh, the pyramids on in divine. I don't know if you've seen Divine Science, uh, the episode one I put out, but um, it kind of goes into something similar, where um, uh, well, shape the geometry of it is definitely important, and the right. size of it is important. If you look at the the length, like how tall it is. I think it's, oh, well, from what we see, I believe it's like 700 feet or something. Don't quote me on that. I could be completely off on that one. Well, my question is, do you think bubble cavitation could be happening or, you know, like- Yes, uh, right at the peak. Collapse? Right yeah. at the peak, okay? So right do at you... the top of the pyramid, when when the uh, they had the, um, oh my gosh, brain fart, I'm sorry. It's it's like the apex stone, okay. So when they mm. had that on there, it would it's like a focal point, like a, a focusing lens, and it would create 
a beam that went straight up without having it there it actually creates a sphere of energy right at the top of it and that was proven in 1913 i think or it might have been 19 yeah joe parr also did experiments uh regarding the top of the pyramid didn't he is that the gentleman with the um wine bottle and the aluminum foil no Joe no, Parr was on Ancient Aliens, and he did a, a thing where he made a pyramid of his own. And then underneath it, he put it in uh, rotational magnets or whatever they call it. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah, centrifuge. One. Yeah. Centrifuge. There you go. Mm. Um, um, Wes, I'm trying to think of his name now. Wes. Oh, I'm brain farting tonight. I apologize, gentlemen, but... No, the, it's okay. There's a there was a guy back in the late seventies, early eighties that built a, a forty foot pyramid out of two by fours, and he had a big copper coil that was wrapped on the ground, and he had a copper coil that was at the apex on the inside of the pyramid, and he attached the two together with a uh, piece of sheep's wool. And it gave him such a shock, it threw him 30 feet. Oh, wow. Woke up, like, five minutes later, and his <laughs> arm hurt, and everything hurt, and there was yeah. a burn in his hand. <laughs> and there was a what in his hand? A burn in his hand. Oh, so, wow. I believe, and this goes to what I was saying earlier about the shape and the size and what's going on with the pyramid, is because it was so high up, every time the Earth turns, whether we see it or not, when a pyramid or a tower or a radio tower or anything like that is up in the air and insulated in a, in a very specific way, when you ground that out, all that static flows down like a freight train. Oh, so it's channeling the ions from the atmosphere. Exactly. And if you wow. can that flow, you have energy forever. It was the principle that the Wardenclyffe Tower is built yeah. on. And that was that, that was part of my theory in divine science. Uh, <laughs> it, it was using um, some kind of uh, chamber uh, to you know channel um, the uh, ionized air in the atmosphere that naturally just occurs. Remember, electricity flows two ways at all times. Mm -hmm. You may not see it, you may not know it, but it flows two ways at all times. And if that's fascinating. You could if you could capture one of those ways as the other one's flowing, it doesn't even affect the flow. And <laughs> you have power <laughs> forever. <laughs> so let me throw you wow. in another curveball. You have to put metal at the top of the pyramid no matter what you do. Yes, something very Like conductive. Electrum? Because the top, if you, if you see the earth in the top as the positive and the ground as the negative, it'll have to have somewhere to flow. So that's why it has to be electrically connected. That's why grounding rods work on the top of towers. Absolutely. But now I have a theory about towers probably get me in trouble. Have you ever, or even high voltage power lines? Okay, so I did an experiment a couple of years ago. Take two poles, go up 20 feet, then take a line of copper, go... It's pretty hard to do. I went 40 feet. Guys say you have to go about 65. It worked for me. I didn't get a lot, but it kind of freaked me out because it worked. You go 40 feet and pull the pole, and, and the copper wire, I strung it as tight as I could, but they were insulated from the pole. Then I grounded it out through one of my coils and then into a battery, and that battery was charged so fast, I thought it was going to explode. You know why? Why is that? Energy lines are based on what you get out of a generator, not what is AC or DC. So yes. when you get it out of a generator, it flows over things, not through them. Therefore, it chases a small bit of amp through that wire, just enough, kind of like the tortoise and the hare. You know what I mean? It yep. pulls it, and then it goes and flows around that wire the whole time. Anytime a bird gets on, it goes over it because it's part of the wire at that point. That's the way the electricity sees it. Yep. So they put anti-sway mechanisms on the high-voltage lines 
because that energy, if it's pushed back and forth, will flow out and out and out. And that's what you're getting. Absolutely. <laughs> so, hey, I got another question for you, Joe. All right. So, you know what's going on with the pyramid, right? Pretty, I, I believe I do, yeah. I could be so, wrong, but I believe I do. So, the question is, is it, if you put pyramids around the whole planet, is it terraforming? Uh, I believe it's stabilizing our electromagnetic field, and I believe that's what uh, initiated our first electromagnetic field that's now failing to some degree. So it makes it stronger. I think it reinforces it, yeah, absolutely. So it could have – so here, here's the thing that I'm thinking, okay? It will actually make it stronger or weaker, and then the moon itself where the moon is would make it stronger or weaker too – you know what I mean? Because the tidal yes. force inside of it gives the energy to the planet. Absolutely. So, and did you, go ahead. So, so if you're on Mars and you got two moons that are like asteroids, all you have to do is compile them together and make a bigger moon. Then the tidal forces will bring in the energy to bring out the magnetosphere. That's definitely possible. Did you hear about the experiment? I'm not sure who did it. But when it, oh, I can't. I think it was NASA, and they messed up on, on one of their satellites or one of their rovers or whatever, and it hit the moon, and the moon rang like a bell, reverberated like it, like it echoed, like it was yeah. hollow, like it was hollow. So it makes one wonder. I mean, is that part of the mechanism that our planets? Uh, Field actually gets renewed through vibration that we're not aware of. I mean, I don't know. It's all resonance. We talked about this earlier. It's oh yeah, for sure. I'm telling you, the resonance chamber at the center of our Earth. It's not a big ball of uh, magma. Yeah, he was just talking about that that earlier. I believe that. Check this out. So you say it rings hollow, right? Yeah. And if it's all in crystalline form on the inside, which they say that everywhere you go on the moon. They find crystals, right? One of the easiest things to set up in space is to build crystals. So when you go out there, it's microwaves that build them. So if he sat right over the top of the earth and we wanted to grow crystals all day, we could, right? Okay. So it's pretty easy to build them in space. What I'm saying is maybe, just maybe, and you have to see some things in an expansive way here, there would be a planet right after Mars, but before Jupiter, that's in the asteroid belt. It could be a small planet, but if it has a hollow center and we captured that as the moon, it would have been there. So the reason I think it's a capture is this. We had like billions of years ago uh, on this earth, we had the actual uh, oceans come up to the surface and then up into mountain ranges and they were on the ocean floor at that time. So when you capture something, what you're going to find is a hook that goes around and partial, then it'll stop. And then on another side, you'll find the same thing that'll happen as it gets into the right area to settle into where it's at. So I truly think that we captured this moon and it was something else before we got it. That's possible. You hear about... uh... If you look at the electric universe and their theory on how certain things were thousands of years ago with the way that Venus and Mars and everything lined up and we'd see it in the sky, makes one wonder all it would take is something to shift everything out of play. And then, like you said, who knows, maybe one asteroid belt hit uh, part of a planet and that was it knocked it out of its own gravity field and that's how we captured it. I really don't know. I don't look into astro mechanics very much, but that's an interesting. They, they have a they have a story on it in cuneiform. Oh, so, yeah. So they they have a translation. I, I'll find the video for you. But they translate it as there was another planet there, and you know Mars was livable at that time. I believe it was, it was livable once. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying so hard to get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know how this all works, man. We all could have been. <laughs> You're not wrong. I believe our history isn't. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, 
I believe what we're taught in our history isn't isn't completely true. Uh, I think, mm, yeah, you know, things have been embellished and other things have been left out. I don't know how much is true and how much isn't because, frankly, I wasn't there. <laughs> but there's so some, a lot of cognitive dissonance too. Yeah, yeah. It's your best guess, man. That's all it is. Basically, yeah. Yeah, they can't tell you any different than that. I mean, mm. they can't prove a bit of what they're saying. And especially well, you know, when you have uh, an entire system of academia based on, uh, you know, people's reputations that are maintained by the status quo, <laughs> you know, yeah. don't rock yeah. the status quo. You're going to ruin my reputation. <laughs> well, see, now there's the other part. Uh, the last APEC, oh, I wish I had been on because here's the weird part, actually, in my I've got the paper sitting like right here. I was going to talk about Albert Einstein. And I was going to talk about Henry Poincare and how it all came about and the controversy around it. But the guy on APEC already did. <laughs> and the thing that I found funny was everybody went kind of quiet there because mm. their papers and their work and their studies and 90% of academia is based on what Albert Einstein's E equals MC squared calculation is. And well, there's a lot right. more than that, but... It's, it's a key component. Well, the right. funny thing is, is Henry Poincaré came up with it, I think, 10 years prior before yeah. Einstein. So yeah. it, it's very interesting how that It makes me out. wonder if if Albert Einstein, and this is just a, a crackpot theory. I, it wasn't even a theory. It's just an idea that ran through my head one day. But what if Einstein was a disinformation can, candidate, you know, uh, designed whether he knew it or not to uh, discredit the ether or, or, you know, push us away from that? Maybe, but he was really intelligent on his own. I think it was more like he was working in the uh, patent office. Mm -hmm. Henri Poincaré went to patent it. He looked at it, went to promote him and realized, you know what? Mm. They don't know who this guy is. I yeah. Can't in here and just promote it for him. Uh, so he was the OG patent shark. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't maybe. Know. It's, just, it's just a thought, like you said. It's it's yeah. the woo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's it's interesting to think about. Let, let's explain the ether real quick, just so you guys all understand this, okay? Yeah. Probably on the same page as I am. Even if you have a spinning ball of magnet at the center, it is still a rotating magnet. Therefore, Spheres of energy will go around it tight, then away from it, then away from it, and then away from it at different strengths, right? Yep. You cannot get away from that. So no matter how they want to quantify the ether, it's still there because right. there's energy in each sphere and each one is different. So they can't deny it because it's there. Even in their simple proof of there's magma in the center or nickel, whatever they want to say it is, it still produces energy in that way. So you still have it and you still have a divider at the equator that doesn't make sense in everything until you start seeing energy flow as two toroidals. I agree. There was a video that got put out a couple of weeks ago. Like I'll have to find it for you, but the, the Morley experiment, Morley Melt, I'm not Michelson even. Morley, yeah. Thank you very much. That experiment, he took the experiment and he turned it vertical, and it proves that the ether is real. But wow. the way that they did the experiment was wrong for one, and for mm. two, their interpretation was incorrect. Now that's me stating that big bold statement. I agree, but right, lots of people know this but they keep it secret and it's a lot of people in academia. Well, they don't keep it secret. It's not a conspiracy. They just don't talk about it. Um, the ether that was just banished and it was replaced with the quantum vacuum. And they all know that hmm. they believe in the ether. They're just trying to figure it out. They called it a different name because they don't want anybody else looking at it. Ex explain to me the difference though. What is the quantum vacuum in, in mainstream physics? Oh man, I would have to be like. Yeah, there's no simple way to explain. I have to, be a David <laughs> to do that, you know what I mean? And then to bring no, no, it it's okay. from, from his terms to layman's terms, I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, because yeah, 
I don't even think that that uh, uh, Richard Feynman knew what the quantum vacuum was. So, that's and that's another they, that's another issue, though, is like it, the explanations of the universe should be simple, right? They shouldn't be overly complex. Yeah, I think well, humans know, have a tendency to overly complex, you know, complicate things. I agree. You know the kiss theory. Keep it simple. Yeah, but they don't yeah. do that, right? It's, <laughs> As complicated as it can get with muons and muons and buons and gluons. And, I don't know. I, I'm not, and <laughs> yeah, I, I don't go with the whole terminology and play that sort of game. I mean, if, if that's what floats their boat, all the power to them. It ain't going to make no lick of difference. If I flick a switch on mm -hmm. and the power, the light doesn't go on, they did something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And if yeah. I go and make a system and flick a switch on, they can call well, it whatever they want. They can deny it whatever they want. As long as the light turns on, none of that matters. Well, like Ken Wheeler likes to say, they're describing something, but they're not defining it. You know, they're not explaining it. Well, they're you know not what I mean? how to do it either. Yeah. Right? Well, they keep that part close to the chest, which mm -hmm. to some degree I understand. Like for me, I want to release the tech for free, but like the plants. But I also want to be a person who builds a company selling devices for based sure. on that tech. But I'll yeah. give the tech away for free because then you might want to go build it. But there's a thousand people out there that don't know how, and there's 10,000 mm -hmm. people that don't want to. Right. You know what and, I mean? and like I always say, the science belongs to everybody. But if you can market it, you know, more power to you because in this economy, you. <laughs> Uh, money is power, and a lot, a lot of people have money. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, let me share something funny with you guys. Even if we got <laughs> cars that are based on water, right? Yeah. Don't ever think that you're going to pull up to the ocean and get the water. Okay? Yeah. It, it's going to be shipped to a place. They're going to filter mm. the water. They're going to change it, and they're going to say it has so much more benefits to it, just like they do in California, and they're going to put it right back in the gas pump, and tell you to buy it that way. And then they're going to find the living daylights out of you if they even see you sipping a puddle for that water. You're not wrong. At least they're going to try anyway. See, where mm. is it that... What, I wonder when it stopped. When the governments... When the people had to start listing the governments rather than the governments listening to the people. When did that change, I wonder? Because I'll hmm. tell you, I know of three people alone that built free energy devices. And yeah, they disappeared, but it wasn't by some guy in a suit. No, no, they went and bought a cottage and they've been living for free for the last 30 years. Yeah, so, they don't want to be bothered. <laughs> exactly, because they know if they patent it or sell it or release it, some guy in a suit's going to come along because his his uh, uh, money or his bank account's going to dwindle because he but if. Peace. But if your ultimate goal isn't to be super rich and you just want to be self-sufficient, that's all you need. You know what I mean? You, you don't need wrong. to market or pat. Yeah, you just need the device and go out, live off the grid. That's what I'd like to do, to be honest. <laughs> I'll be completely honest with everybody. I want to be half rich. And then I want to take all that money and I want to build orphanages. I want to build uh, rehab centers. I want to build commendable. housing. And all because the energy will be free to do all that. Not yeah. only that. Helping people in rehab with these kind of vibrations and 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 certain natural healing. instead of pills and sh yeah exactly like we could do a lot of good for a lot of people that need it with for this sure. tech. and when I was mentioning earlier sure I want to be one of the people that sells devices to people when this mm -hmm. tech is fully understood there will be so many devices built on this that and you know what it will be insane and I can that. I only want to build one or two. I mean, hey. <laughs> and when, yeah, and when that happens, I want to emphasize. So when when this happens, and it will happen, um, because you can't put the cat, cat back, back in the bag. The cat's out of the bag now with, with all these devices coming out and, and all the, the celebrities actually catching on to them. No. So <clears throat> when that happens, the, the since you know the energy is free, the cost of manufacturing is going to be negligent. So that means devices that you want to sell are going to be very cheap, and you're still going to make a you know decent profit. You, you <clears> know <throat> what, guys? I have no interest in doing any of that. Simply going to build stuff, let people see it, and then I'll just tour the country 
and talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I'll, that's I'll make my little reason, fortune, set up my family, and do my own thing and my own re research. The and reason let them why I if they want to. The reason why I started Beneficence TV isn't, you know, isn't to make money either. It's to to spread a, a message. So, you know, that's my ultimate goal. I don't want to make money. I just want to help spread the message of, of these devices and, and the forbidden science behind them, you know? So I'm hey, right there with you, Nate. <laughs> I, I'm working on something that's big. Do you want to be the my United States connection and you can tour the states just showing it off? Yeah, absolutely. That would be yeah, awesome. That would be You'd have yeah, to come with the order to pick it up, though, because <laughs> it has to be pulled by a vehicle. Hey. Check this out. <laughs> It'll give every one of those mathematicians something to quantify. Oh, because, yeah. Because yeah. Now sure. they're not quantifying some other theory of another theory of another paper. Now they're quantifying a real device. Now yeah. it's time to do the work. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, well, well, well I'm, I'm down. I don't know about you, but I'm down. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I, I want to get this out to everybody. But before I go big like that, I have to have it debunked. <laughs> sort of thing, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, you know, I put that much money into building a big system that could be toured and then, <laughs> you know. But like that. Nathan said, you know, I have fun building these things and, you know, I'm I'm not as uh, uh, informed as you guys, but I'd still like to learn and, and uh, build more devices like this for sure. Well, if you want to start going into the avenue, I did a good person to start with as a guy by the, a gentleman by the name of Mike Powers. Mike Powers. He builds, like yeah, he builds a star chalice coil. And, um, oh, there's another type of coil. It's a vortex coil. I I started out with Rodin. Well, that's not entirely true. I started out with Bedini. And mm. then I found Rodin. I looked at his math for a while. I didn't agree with it. And then I have an issue with his his beliefs and how he found it. And that's just my personal opinion. I won't Who, Marco Rodin. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't agree with Marco Rodin's uh, math or, or his uh, system of belief. But I'm not going to lie that the origins of VBM are, is very controversial, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. And Hey, if I'm wrong, then I'll be corrected somewhere along the way and I'll apologize. But and there's, then, there's no, yeah, there's no shame. <clears throat> and having your own beliefs and opinions and theories. Yeah, you know I don't. That? I'm not harping on them. I just don't yeah. agree with it, so I kind of stay away from 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 the Roden situation, but, right? And upon yeah, looking it's at it, but it's actually refreshing to see somebody who actually has such an amazing device, and they do have a, a new take on things. You know, so that's <laughs> that's also refreshing to see for me. Gerald, I got a question for you. You said a while back, and I haven't been able to get with you. What did you have on the gravity flyer? Was there something interesting you had going on in your coil that you wanted to share that matched what I was doing? Well, that's the story that I told Jeremiah. I haven't told anyone else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. All right. I knew I there was that. something good. Okay, I'll tell you what. This may get I don't I don't even know if I should do this, but uh, I'm gonna. So take it not with a grain of salt. Take it with a big freaking truckload of it, okay? <laughs> so that being said, I'm going to tell you something that happened to me that almost killed me, freaked me right out, and made me put the tech down for three years. So the big coil that you see, uh, it didn't always have uh, resin over it. It wasn't always a, a solid resin coil. At one point, it was just open air copper like a bunch of my other coils. Okay. I had to put it in resin because I was putting like 10 volts in it and I was getting breakout. Oh. Yeah. So I wanted to save it because it was such a, it, it did some very unique things. So you know those plasma globes that you can buy at uh, Walmart or online, Amazon, whatever? Uh, they were based on Tesla's little you put your hand on it and the stringers hit your fingers. Yeah. Oh, plasma yeah. balls. Plasma balls, right? So I had broken one at one point and I thought, you know what? I want to try this. I'm going to put this through my coil. Let's see what high voltage does. <laughs> so I put it on a table. I raised it six inches above the table with this little rack. 
Um, and underneath it, I put an aluminum, uh, what, what, what would you call it? It's like the base pan for a record player, and it mm -hmm. was an aluminum plate, okay? So I put that underneath the rack, and I got the coil on the rack, and I took the uh, plasma balls high voltage output, and I put it to the input of the primary, and then the output of the primary, I ran a line um, about 10 feet away from it, and I attached it to my uh, hot water radiators because I was using that for a ground, right? Because, of course, you got the pause. You can't run it back to the coil, right? So uh, I had that set up. And then in the secondary, I had a 3 kV capacitor in there. So I turned this on and nothing's happening. I'm not getting any sparks. I'm not getting any glow. Nothing. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong. So I shut it off. I look at all the wiring. I'm like, oh, everything looks right. Turn it back on. Nothing. Nothing's happening. I wait a few minutes just to see what's going on, right? Again, nothing. I'm like boggled. So I shut it off. I walk away and I'm like, well, you know what? It, it, it holds capacitance all on its own just because of the way it's built. So maybe, maybe it has to build up capacitance. Mm. So I I turn it back on for the third time and nothing's happening and I'm, I'm getting frustrated. So I go to move a wire and I bump something on the table and the whole kit and caboodle starts to come off of it. I don't know what fell, but it made a loud bang and the coil jumped up six feet in the air and out of reflexes because I've been in martial arts since I was like 10 years old. I had a reflex as my arm went out and I caught the thing in my hand and the sound, oh, wow. I was frozen. Okay? I couldn't move any muscle in my body and the sound that went through me, it felt like it went through every cell and it was like, <laughs> and it vibrated everything and it, it felt like the whole room was shaking. Wow. And then I dropped the coil and I, and I went upstairs and I told my wife, I was like, I, I, I just got electrocuted. And she sat me down and apparently I just shook there for an hour. Because <laughs> oh, I don't, wow. my, I was kind of out of it. I had to, my brain had to recalibrate, I guess. Yeah. I reset it though. The yeah. fact that it jumped up. And then when Nathan was explaining how the gravel flyer works and how the charge separation works, now you have to build up capacitance and turn your, high voltage off and on and off and on. And all of a sudden yeah. you get that sonic pump and it jumps. Well, guess what? When that, whatever fell off the table made that bang, that was the trigger. That's crazy. No, and, and I don't know if this has anything to do with the Searle effect generator either, but uh, John Searle reported the same thing when he turned his Searle generator on for the first time. It, it kind of flew up. It's all about vortexes and capacitance. It's mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And I believe that I believe that the gravel flyer creates a vortex, but it yeah. has to build up capacitance in a high voltage way so that when it releases and it gets that hop off the ground, it's mm -hmm. able to sustain itself. Kind of like right. when the pyramid starts and it ionizes the whole area, it has to start to do it, right? Same thing. There's like a threshold effect. I believe so. I could be wrong, yeah. but that's the first time I've told the public that story. So if I get shot, well, you, <laughs> you hear it here first. No, no, no. Just check on, check I'm in kidding. with us every day. You'll be all right. So check it out. What if I told you, you actually changed the octave in the coil and you found the absolute correct spot to get the highest pitch possible on there of the amount of energy, not the one that looks the highest on the oscilloscope. The one that has the most energy in it, and that's what hit it. Wow. Hmm. I believe that totally. So so when I always say it, it's like a saw, right? Saw blade. It goes like this. Yeah. You find it in the right groove, okay? Yeah. And that's what you did. You found that groove where you could amplify the most, and then hmm. it just, boom, instantly wow. released all the energy into the coil and just Created a tremendous force up. So oh, was yeah, it creating yeah. like a backdraft of counter space? 
Uh, that's a good question. You know, or what? was it creating like maybe I don't know bubbles? because it, huh. it was so fast. Like I can't mm -hmm. explain to you how fast my arm shot out to catch it. So mm -hmm. I, like it happened so quick. Yeah, and, and no, so, I believe that when you have those reflexes, you just don't think; you just react. Yeah, so check this out. So if you see the Earth again, positive on top, negative on the bottom. Absolutely. And if you could see it as an ion flow, okay. If they got mm. closer, it'd look like an ion flow. So you'd be putting out plasma like a plasma bridge or something like that, right? Mm. Yeah. So now what that does is when it's so thin, it puts out pure charge. Does not put out electromagnetism, it puts out charge. Mm. Now, see that gravity flyer in the center of that charge. You can manipulate where it is based on which field is going on and moving the charge. Yep. Mm. So yep, if you that makes sense. Just okay, have that, to that's jump it, it and jump it and jump it. And you get what I'm saying? It wants to stay in that steady spot where it's made a, a connection between the top and the bottom. It likes to stay right in that spot. So, so you're creating like an a, a, like a node or an anti-node for it to just well, settle this in. Will twist your brain. That sounds more like uh, Jacob's ladder to me. <laughs> exactly. Cool. The one you can yeah. actually walk up. <laughs> <laughs> I always say it's like a spiral staircase. Yeah, it just absolutely. Jumps, it jumps, it jumps, it jumps. Just keep going up. Absolutely. Like I said, guys, I I know what this thing's doing. It's just a matter of getting it to the right area. You know what I mean? And, it, and I know part. you see it. I absolutely know you see it because when you were describing what you're describing, I understood because of what happened with me, and I went. You know what? He's gonna do it. He's got it. So <laughs> yeah. go for it, man. I'll wait till you get yours done, and then I'll do mine. <laughs> well, that, again, that's why I'm adding the Tesla coil to. It. I was talking earlier about what I was doing with the Tesla coil, right? So I use a ZVS circuit in this one that puts it out at one value, and then yeah. I flip the switch, and it automatically goes 20 volts higher on the input to go into it and turns off to the other one. So it'll have a jump feature, okay? Nice. So it'll automatically expand the field immensely. And that's going to be tied into the piezoelectric buzzer. So when I switch from regular kilohertz to the megahertz that are in that piezo buzzer, yeah. it's going to hit at the exact same time that I'm hitting that energy. So what you experienced in your coil, the buildup yep. on it, and then the energy blast is exactly what I'm looking for. There was one other thing. I uh, I took um, a piezo. Well, I took three of them, actually. And I put them side by side with each other, and I focused them on the top of my coil. And when I turned them on, what I did is I ran them in series with my secondary. So when I turned the coil on, they turned on. But through the coil, usually it sings, okay? Like, it makes this high-pitched sound all the time. And... With those on, I could hear the Doppler effect perfectly. Yeah. Perfectly. It was You know crazy. why? Not exactly. Okay. I have an idea, but not exactly. Quartz crystal has oxygen in it, and oxygen can be magnetized by your coil. Oh. So, you, you know, people don't understand this. When you take out a lot of the amps and you put a lot more volts in there, you're going for a charge effect. Yeah. And it'll charge it. And then if you put more amps in there than volts, you're going for a magnetic, you know, a magnet effect, right? Yeah. So just think about that when you're doing your amps and volts and you put the piezo up there. If you're locking into the oxygen inside that crystal, you're going to get a response. That's interesting. I never thought of it that way. I want a really big one, but I haven't gotten one yet. I bought an ultrasonic cleaner and I, I just don't want to wreck it to take the the big PA so out of it. <laughs> I got a 10-pound uh, uh, piece of quartz sitting in my uh, in my front yard. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I cut it up in slices sometimes. I take parts of it and run it because I'm trying to find that perfect frequency to hit the oxygen in there to make it light up without touching it. I just bought myself last week. I was looking for a piece of quartz. I was looking for one shaped a certain way. I've looked everywhere. I could order them online, but I haven't done that yet because we got uh, porch pirates around here. 
No. Oh. So yeah, it's just a pain. But so I went and found this pipe in a, a shop, like a weed shop, and it's shaped like a pointed obelisk. Okay. But it, but it's got a hole through it. I don't know how it's going to react, but I'm going to stick it in the center of my coil and run it. There's an experiment that was talked about by T.T. Brown. I think it was T.T. Brown that did it, where the crystal after a while starts to resonate and starts to grow, and then it loses weight. That'd be awesome. Yeah, so that's something I want to try, but it's nothing like what you're talking about. I'd much rather have a big raw stone I can, you know, cut pieces off of or chunk pieces off of. This thing's nice, but uh, I don't know. With the holes, it might do something different that I'm not uh, expecting. You know what I mean? Oh, I do know what you mean. It, you know, you got to try it just to see what it does. Yeah, you're not wrong. I'm going to try it for sure. I, I, I did a uh, uh, test with quartz. So, uh, I'm sorry, granite. You take granite, it has quartz in it, right? Yep. You put it in a bowl. And at that time, I had a lot of fluoride in California. They put it in the water. So you put it in the bowl, and you're going to get conductivity out of it. Now, okay. could that you, you say, okay, let me isolate it. Let me take out the quartz. Does the water have conductivity, like a capacitor with two rods going into it? You know what I mean? And, yeah. the, and the answer was no. So I put salt in a separate test to see if it was salt water that could give me that. The answer was no. So... Here's the crazy thing that happened. I would add another bowl and we just drop a wire from the bowl to the next bowl. I didn't even hook it to the quartz. So at the time I got six bowls in, a, in the row, one end of my multimeter was on one side, one side's on the other. I looked at conductivity and all that it would do was continue to rise. It would continue ah. to rise the amount of conductivity in it. That's interesting. Crazy, That's huh? Very interesting, actually. It's think <laughs> yeah that's what i mean about the pyramid so many blocks into it when you put the water into it the conductivity rises as you add the mass to it i wonder if it's just charge density like i i i'm just curious as to how that works because one of my breakthroughs recently had to do with water and i could use the negative on my secondary put it in uh bowl of water on one end of the bowl of water and use a ferrite core on the other side of the bowl of water and pick up power and it's just tap water and i've tested the conductivity there's no conductivity in it whatsoever so i don't know if it's uh but a the water goes into the ferrite and and uh like fills it up full of water isn't it right yeah yeah it must right it's porous yeah. to some degree so if anything that could produce electricity gets water into it, which is actually making it conductive, then it's making it where it can produce the energy out of it. That's interesting thought. I'm going to have to test that theory. I like that. I love testing new theories. It's yeah, well, it's, it's going from potential to a viable thing. That's all. When you look at piezoelectricity, it can create electricity when it's struck and yeah. it can create it. If you resonate the oxygen, the actual, the rest of the crystal won't do anything. I always thought it was the crystal resonating, but that makes sense. No, it has to be something in there that can work with something else outside of it. So people tap these things all the time. And when they put the two plates to it, uh, when they do it in the military and they yeah. put two plates on each side, they actually create a pulse between the electrodes. So they they hit it one side, hit it the other side, and it's just producing energy based on when it hits it, and it picks up the energy from the crystal on the outside and brings it into the wire. Huh, that's interesting. So, yeah, people keep telling me that this thing's going to be able to turn on, and I go, well, you haven't figured out how to turn it on yet. Yeah, basically. So, I know what you mean by that. I believe it can, I believe it can do it. Yeah, look, I, I'm all for healing with crystals. I just believe you have to turn it on first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was... I don't think they're meant to be used for healing as much as they're meant to be used as a, a resonating factor to get the frequency going for healing. 
You know what I mean? I think yeah. we already have it in us, but I think that because quartz resonates at a certain frequency at a certain size, you know, there's factors involved, but uh, I think that, yeah, it's about the sound, about that vibration. Well, let's put it this way. Things may seem like they resonate at the right frequency that you think you have, but only when you hit the correct frequency does it light up. Yeah. So it may be yeah. something that's working in a way just like a Tesla coil. So it, you have different uh, radio frequencies that you put into it, right? And depending on which one you hit, you get a certain resonance value. That's you true. may not be on the correct one when it comes to quartz yet. Yeah, you might be right on that one. I had a, I, I was doing tests with this coil about 10, no, yeah, about 10 years ago now. And my buddy had gout in his big toe. And uh, he had gone to the doctor and they said, well, the only thing we could do is operate. And he's like, I don't want to do that. So he comes back to, he was living with us at the time. We had a big house. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, well, I just got all of Raymond Rife's frequencies. How would I run it through my coil and we'll just do a test? But I warn you, I don't know what it's going to do, you know. And and told him all the disclaimer of it. And he said, yeah, no, I accept that. That's fine. Let's try it. Within two weeks, he cracked his toe and the gout was gone. I don't know if it was the vibration, the energy, the frequency. I don't know. It wasn't a controlled experiment. It was just he was in the room when I was doing experiments and his foot felt better. And we came up with this idea of why don't so, we try it? And then I looked for the frequencies and we did. So, Can I tell you a cool experiment that I saw? I'll probably tell you the answer. Go ahead. He, this guy took diamonds and he put them oh. in a... Uh, like oxygen chamber. So nothing can get in there. It's just sealed, right? Yeah. Then he put in pure oxygen and then heated it. So he had done a control experiment where he heated it with no oxygen in there and it did nothing to the actual diamonds. As soon as he add pure oxygen to it, it dissolved the diamonds into nothing. Whoa. So when you start thinking about that and you start thinking about the oxygen being heated, once the oxygen wanted to bond with another oxygen atom, you basically allowed the heat to get into it and tear away this, this piece of diamond to nothing. That's interesting. That's oh, very man. interesting. <laughs> but that's the coolest thing in the world, right? Yeah, you're not wrong because you know what? That goes along with what I was saying a few lives back about how I believe that Time is a form of energy that could be imparted into every cell. What if it's directly connected to oxygen in some way, shape, or form? Well, see, that's the same thing with the gravity flyer. We build these fields, right? But I'm telling you right now, we have to take it and take the oxygen in it, and we have to polarize that. You know what I mean? We, 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 yeah. have, to, we have to create power inside of it. And when I do my paper lifter experiment, I'm dealing with pure charge. I've eliminated the voltage. I've eliminated all the other things in it. It's down to like 90% charge and 10% of the other stuff. Yeah. So, so I get a pure charge out of it. Now I'm hoping I can get oxygen to charge because I charge it inside my paper lifter. When I do that experiment, the reason it has so much more force is because I'm adding mass to it by charging the oxygen. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So when I come out with that number on there, I don't expect to get grams. I expect it to be way, way higher in the amount of power it puts down to it. No, I get that much, yeah. So I hope, I hope you get to do it. I really do. I hope you're the first one to make that sucker float. Because oh. uh, you're working hard at that puppy. And, and you, so you have, it, have the concept. You're going to get like a month straight of me flying this thing in every different <laughs> area. You know, I'll buy, you know, a couple thousand dollar cameras just to show it off that there is no string. I, man, I can't well, wait for that day. If, if you do it, then I'll do it solid state. And then we can test that theory to see if when two fields get close together, they, they multiply. Yep. So they'll fly together. Right? 
I don't know. It's an interesting thought. It doesn't have to be a rotating disc if you understand energy as a flow. Yeah. And I keep telling uh, Benefactor that the coil that he's working on is an energy flow. Yeah. So if you start seeing that and you build your coils above and beneath the center plate, then solid state's going to be fairly easy if you can understand the flow of it, just like you understand yours. Well, that was part of what my presentation's about, is actually talking about the flow and how these coils, when I first started, they were based on the, um, the atomic structure of elements that, to the best of my understanding, and I look at them and I can see how they flow three-dimensionally, and I kind of mimic that. See, I had this thing when I was a kid, and I still kind of have it. I can look at something, pull it apart with my mind, look at each piece, and put it back together. And if it doesn't work, I can pull it apart, pull the piece out, put another piece in, make it work, and then I can go build it. I've been doing that since I was a kid. So I, I, I always tell people, when you see a clock, you just see a hand moving. Yeah. When I see a clock, I see all the parts inside. Yeah, see, you have the same thing. You can just, you know exactly what's in there, how it's working. You Even if you look in the back, you know exactly what gear is going to be where to what because every arm's got a turn and they're all interconnected. That's so, why we, my wife gives me those projects of those little cheap things from Ikea or whatever she tries to buy. <laughs> yeah. I, I take a look at the picture of how it's all separated apart, right? And I will never read the instruction. Yeah, me neither. I can see exactly how it's built before, even if it's sitting in a pile. I just got to see the picture. Oh, he's oh, back. Benefit. Yeah, he's, are you back? I think his power went out is what he said in the stream. Yeah, I seen it in the comments section. He just got his power back on. Yeah, my power went out. There it, he is. It, I get brown out sometimes. Yeah, They're coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. We need to set you up with one of my new systems that I've come up with. I figured out a way of, uh, I won't give it fully away, but I figured out a way of uh, uh, shrinking the solar footprint. Drastic. Uh, say that again? What were you shrinking? I figured out a way of shrinking the solar footprint. So, you know, you have to have, like, say, uh, let's see, six, eight solar panels of, of the highest wattage in order to equal 5,000 watts. So you got to have that on your roof. You got to pay for an, uh, an electrician to come in and tap it in, and sometimes even a structural engineer for your roof. Yeah. So it's a big cost. It's an expense. Well, I figured out a way to bypass all of that and close the footprint where. It's it goes in a geometrical way so that it it doesn't take up a ton of space. Is it with the existing for solar panels, or you got something different? Is it say that again? Is it with the existing solar panels, or is it something different? No, it's with existing solar panels. It's just the way that it's put together, and the way that it unfolds. That's as much as I can give you. <laughs> but when it's, well, I'm I'm gonna do the big uh, uh, unveil. I hope it's going to be done. I got 90% of the welding done, but I want to do the big unveil uh, at the end of the presentation on August 3rd. Oh, so I have to tell you, Gerald, I'm really excited for your presentation. <laughs> Every time you, you speak, you're, you have something cool that you're working on and I'd like to learn more. <laughs> oh, I got scooped today oh, by whatever. tech ingredients. I love it. This guy's a genius. Hey, I, I don't, I'm not insulting the guy. I give him kudos, man. I'd applaud him. If, but if he scooped me. Uh, he built the thing that I have literally designed and written in a book, and I've been meaning to do, but I haven't had the chance to get done. Oh, so he's to... passing it off as his own? Well, no, it's his, okay? Oh, it's it, his? It, it's like the thing we talked about with the 100 monkey experiment, okay? Oh, I so it's just like happening. It's yeah, happening. I, <laughs> literally, I drew it, designed it, dated it. It's in my book. I left it there. And it's a, it's a thing I kept wanting to go back to. I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to do it. But I got so much other things on my plate. I just put it aside. So today, Tech Ingredients comes out with an experiment on how he could use an air conditioner in the winter to heat his house. 
and he proved that it was better than a heat pump. A small window air conditioner at 450 watts produces more heat than a 1500 watt heater, both running for a half hour period of time. Blew my mind. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. So how does it did, work? Well, he took a bedroom and he cut a, a hole in the door for his air conditioner. And he put the back side of the air conditioner that you'd normally exhaust your heat from. He put it into the bedroom. Okay. And the cold air was blowing into the hallway. So uh, the experiment went, he put the 1500 watt heater in the room. He turned it on. He had a fan blowing the heat around. So it was an even dis distribution. It ran at 1365 watts for a half hour. Then he shut that off, aired out the room. Then he turned the air conditioner on for a half hour, which only sucks 455 watts. And it heated the room 17 degrees more than the 1500 watt heater. And it did it in the same huh. amount of time for less energy. You know, I'm, I, I bet that the companies that sell those units or sell the heating units know that. <laughs> I bet they I'm know betting that. they do too. <laughs> It, I found it just awesome because I literally have it drawn out for a, it's like a, almost the size of a furnace. It's two air conditioners stacked one on top of the other. The heating side goes into one compartment that's insulated. The cold side goes into the other side that's insulated. And then there's vent that comes off the cold side to go into the furnace for essential air. And there's a vent that comes off the hot side that goes into the furnace for the heating and you just have uh, a vent valve or whatever you call it to shut the vent off depending on which one you're doing at the time so in in the winter i use my air conditioner i haven't done this yet this is a part of the experiment i want to do i use the air conditioner to heat the house and blow the cold air outside and in the summer i blow the cold air into the furnace and blow the hot air outside and it's literally cheaper than running a furnace or electric heaters. Just mind blowing. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, you heard it here, folks. You heard it here. <laughs> they are lying to you. <laughs> it was built to exhaust heat outside was the air conditioner. And that's why it's working that way. Exactly. And it works yeah. so well. That if you capture that heat, it's a heater. It's better yeah. heater than the heaters that are out there. <laughs> just, well, then it, isn't that just a testament to how much waste is, is going through these systems, though? Because isn't that heat waste, the exhaust? Yes. Like, that's wasted that's energy. So again, if, if you know how to convert heat into electricity mm -hmm. and, and you can do that, then you got something going on there. Okay, mm. but now you're talking free energy. What I'm talking about is free heat. No, I, yeah, no, it, you're, yeah. you're talking about a very cool, simple solution to, to solving your heat problem. No, I love it. I love it. It's a hack. It's a life hack. Yeah, it'll help, basically, right? But now, if you couple that to the formula I have for you build a grow room in your house, you run uh, solar paneled uh, pool heaters along the walls as you're growing your food, and that hot water that runs through there goes into your hot water tank, preheating all your hot water which kills the gas bill so much. And in the winter time, you're, or even, yeah, I'd say the winter time, what am I thinking? Your, your grow room exhausts directly into the intake of your furnace, and that blows out through your whole house, saving your hydro bill. And, and you get food in the same process as you do heating your water and heating your house. And because you're growing food, you throw some herbs and spices in there, and it's literally cleaning the air in your whole house. So it acts as an air filter. You, it's a you, formula. It works. You know what, Gerald? You could What's just that? redesign the systems for a house with all that in mind. It'll save us all a ton of money and energy. Well, I do have my own secret blend of herbs and spices. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be a KFC master after a while. <laughs> I can tell you a story about that. It used to get me into trouble, and I got to watch who I tell it to. But KFC, Colonel Sanders, my dad used to work with him. I got really? a picture. Yeah, I got a picture of my dad and Colonel Sanders standing beside each other with my dad in the red suit. 
because he was a district manager for five of the KFCs in the city I live. Okay. I ate so much chicken as a kid. I'm telling you, I got sick of it. <laughs> and you know how they tout it's 11 herbs and spices? Yeah. That's bullshit. It was 13. <laughs> I'll never forget it. They used to literally advertise it's 13 herbs and spices that we have and they're secret and blah, blah, blah. And my dad was such good friends with them. I didn't get the whole list, but my dad used to laugh. He says, the secret ingredient nobody can figure out is baking powder. <laughs> so it yeah, when you're deep, so yeah, when you're deep frying it, what it does, it puts air pockets underneath the skin and it causes it to be extra crispy. That was their secret. Wow. And science, so, chemistry. If, yeah. If you've ever made Chinese food, then you probably know that because they use the same thing. Yeah, see, there you go. Oh, there you that go. makes sense. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, man, it's crazy. Life's crazy. I love it. It's all a big circle. We just don't know which way to go. It really is. <laughs> it really is. Round and round we go until we find out at the <laughs> end, I guess. We're all in the miracle round of life, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's lots of things I want to share this year. It's just, uh, it's hard to kind of get the information out, right? And, well, and hey, we're always here, man. And I know crypto is always there. So as soon as you want to do it, I know you're waiting for APAC, but, you know, let it out, man. I'll let some out before APAC. I actually have a plan for that. I'm gonna release a teaser. Does crypto have free energy Friday? Well, Maybe you can, you know, bust yeah. it out this week. Yeah, well, uh, so does um, the League of Extraordinary Inventors as well. It kind of couples to free energy Friday. So hmm. either way, either or both, whatever. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about this Friday. Can I release that this Friday? Maybe. Maybe I'm not gonna you promise know. you. But maybe, but there's going to be a good teaser before the the conference. I'll tell you that. Ooh, <laughs> you know, like okay. the oh, <laughs> <laughs> we waited, man. I waited. Like I know. Years. I apologize, Nathan. I felt so bad. I was so mad that day. Nobody could talk to me. I was like, just leave me alone. <laughs> I'm still. You still. You still have my mind blown by your theory of the Ankh being a tuning fork. I'm sorry. I'm still. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more than a tuning fork as well. It's actually uh, an electromagnetic motor as well. Uh, what? Yeah, well, there's <laughs> that. Right, no. gotta explain it. Come there's on that. now. I, 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 I'm going to build it and show it. It's not part of the presentation or whatever, but uh, came up with this a few years ago after I watched a guy do a video on it. He was from Africa. And he was explaining what the onk was as a motor. And I was like, what? That's insane. And he talked about it, but he didn't build it. And then I built it and it worked. I just used a piece of copper and I was like, what the hell? And then uh, I'm just looking through this paper. I'm having a hard time finding it. Well, is it like an electromagnetic motor or like? Yeah, a motor? actually, the whole onk itself spins. Put wow. it on a lodestone. Okay. Uh -huh. Create a positive and negative voltage. You know where the arms come out? One positive, one negative. That sucker will start to spin all on its own. <laughs> and you can do this just with, you know, some crystals and, and some... Uh, I don't know about crystals. I, I don't know. But the onk was made out of gold. Or it made was out made of out of electrum. Okay. One or the other. Ele oh, okay, so electrum is what? Gold and silver combined, I think? Yeah, gold, silver, and a little bit of uh, copper and a tiny hmm. bit of nickel. Is that to like maximize the conductivity or something, or is it I just? I think so. I think it had something to do with crystallization, but I don't know mm. for sure. Didn't they have a shipwreck that had that in their cargo hold? Yeah, a ton of it. And then it just wow. like you never heard anything about it after that. That's so interesting, man. Yeah. When, wait. Wait. When did they discover the shipwreck? Oh, uh, I, don't know. I think 90? we heard about ten years ago. Have we heard of that? Oh, ten wow. years ago, might have been. I know it was a while ago. Huh. Oh boy. Yeah, it's <laughs> insane. The real the real truth out there about our history and how these things worked is insane. I feel like it, there was a totally advanced civilization out there that probably lived more in harmony with Earth and then we mm. came along and just okay. did everything else. 
Hey, if Absolutely. you listen to the Indian, um, the Indian Vedic texts, we were in the uh, Kali Yuga. You know, the age of ignorance and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, basically the opposite of spiritual enlightenment. Like, but that's a cycle, though, right? Like, yeah, in their yeah, beliefs, and then that's a cycle. It's, and then there's debate on when it's ending, uh, but it's my belief that we are in the transition of it ending now. Well, I don't know if you guys believe in dreams and visions, but uh, I was given a dream about how the universe is actually shaped. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it was just something my brain came up with. We'd love but, to hear it. I'm interested. Well, it's yeah, like yeah. a big center column, like a tube, and then picture a record that goes around it. And then our sun isn't stationary, neither are our planets, but we're stationary behind the sun. And the sun travels through the universe, spinning slowly, uh, picture it like around a wire, right? And turning at the same time. And we, as our planets, do the same thing. And as we go around this record, we go up, and we go down and we keep going around this record up and down like a, in a sign, sinusoidal way. And right. the positive and negative or north and south pole is at the top of the tube and bottom of the tube. And as we come up over an arch, that's when we're in the like positive, not the Kali Yuga, but the one after that. And as we go down into our, our trough, we're in the Kali Yuga which is our, our dumbed down spot, right? So it's like a sinusoidal movement throughout the universe in a consistent manner throughout all of time, depending how time really works. But that was huh. just a dream. I, I don't know how true it is, right? Yeah, it's interesting to think about. I mean, in dreams could also be messages or metaphors that might not be literal, you know? Oh, some of them are. Yeah. Because well, this sure. oil, the one that you guys see, the big one, that mm -hmm. all came from a dream. The very numbers it took to wind that coil came hmm. from a dream. Wow, that's crazy. No, because yeah. I, I hear that a lot. You know, people who have dreams or visions. You know, Tesla what? had them. Einstein claimed to um, have them. I get I it in the last two minutes of the dream before you wake up. Mm -hmm. When you're starting to realize that it's real life again instead of the dream state. That's when I get the most information. Yep, and you got to repeat it in your mind over and over and over and over so you don't forget it. Yeah, I got up. I have a, a pen and a yeah. paper beside my bed, and I literally will jump out of bed and just start writing. <laughs> yeah, because you'll forget. You're right. You'll forget it. That's right. Uh, yeah, there's been a, quite a few breakthroughs that have happened that way for me. So I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's the universe. Maybe it's my subconscious. Maybe it's a bit of both. I, you know, I believe I believe uh, to some extent we can all tap into the Akashic records. You know, I, I accredit the Akashic records with a couple of my epiphanies. You know, not all of them, but it seems like when I'm meditating, especially, I, I do have um, these these ideas that just kind of flow into my head without any kind of lineage of you know getting there from thought to thought. <laughs> see, and that could be part of the whole hundred monkey experiment. We all yeah. connect at different times to the Akashic records. We mm -hmm. pick up on these things and we bring them out as we connect to each other because we think about them. It would make sense if the Akashic record is actually powering our consciousness. It is our consciousness. You know, we're part of it. I have, I have a different belief, but that's possible. Well, what's your belief? Well, I believe in God, to be honest with you. And I believe that he put certain mechanisms into play for mm -hmm. us to live life with a free will. And I believe that those mechanisms allow us to grow and allow us to uh, mm -hmm. live life in abundance. But because so you of, see, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say because of the powers that ought not be, they don't want to see us live in abundance. So certain right. devices have been hidden and certain things have been kept from us. I'm not saying dastardly on purpose, but maybe mm -hmm. just out of uh, greed because they have a different idea of making money or mm -hmm. I don't know, something along those lines. So, right? so your belief is, uh, you believe that the Akashic or the uh, Aether is a part of God or an aspect of God rather than God itself? Yes, I believe that okay. the Aether is a mechanism that God put into play for oh, a mechanism. not only him, but for all of us. 
I believe that. I think it's kind of like uh, his playground. And we're allowed to tap into it if we don't have that intention to hurt another person. Because I don't think that anybody who works in this field, if they had evil intent, would be able to find any sort of breakthrough that was significant. Yeah. No, I, I had a similar idea that, you know, what if uh, ill intent is what prevents people from accessing the Akashic record, you know? Yeah, I, I would think so. That's just yeah. a thought on my part, though. Well, it, it also goes, guys, I think you resonate differently if you fast. So yes. right. your body isn't uh, dealing with all this food going through your system. Huh. So your heat and everything's different, which changes your resonance frequency of what oh, your wow. body got. That's yeah, interesting. Also, I didn't thought about that way. Yeah, and fasting also allows your body to detox. It gets rid of all the crap and it makes you cleaner. It allows you to heal. Yeah, absolutely. So what if, what if that was just a simple frequency thing? They learned how to tap into the frequency that created when you fast and then continue it in a larger way inside those temples where you see it come down on the top and go yeah. over people. That might just be the same thing. That's interesting. I know there was multiple different frequencies. Uh, I'm buying a new camera setup for the for APEC, but I'll get it before that. And I'll show you this book. I can't remember where I got this information from. But I have the angle and declination of of different pyramids and different uh, times of day where the light comes in to heal different parts of your body, like your liver, your kidneys, uh, brain, heart, uh, broken bones, and the different tone that it takes in order to do it at that declination of light that comes in at that shape of pyramid. I have like a whole page drawn out on it. I got to show it to you. When I get my new camera, it's just freaking crazy. I drew it like 20 years ago almost. Maybe 12 or 18. Probably. Yeah. So, so check it out. I have gout in my right hand. You can probably see how fat it is. Oh, yeah. So it was all in my left side, you know, uh, two weeks ago. Then I blew out my back. And now it's all in my right hand. So it was just like a train wreck for the last three weeks. So check it out. When I go on my diet and I fast, zero yeah. problems with gout, zero problems with any gastrointestinal problems, anything like that. My body doesn't swell or anything like that because I can't have a whole lot of salt or soda. It has to be very minimal in my life. Yeah. But when I fast and do that and drink water and take uh, more protein than anything else in the food, and guys, I'm, I eat four, four inch by four inch container by about you know an inch and a half deep. That's all I'd eat for the day, and then fast in between. Let me tell you what the whole life changing event goes on. No doubt, no doubt, gout sucks, it really sucks. I bet I'm betting that. Oh, I should get something to you. Yeah, we'll have to talk. <laughs> let, let let me think about that one. I'll have to meditate on that one and and, and see because some of the stuff that I make. I get nervous about sending it to the states, right? Like uh, I wanna, I wanted to send something to Jeremiah a long time ago, but I, I was having issues in so many different fronts. My computer was being hacked. I couldn't get any, um, literally, no emails back from any social media whatsoever, and I still can't. But that's when it started, and I was like, you know what? I'm being watched. I don't want to send you something that's gonna get grabbed you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. yeah so if you travel you and i should meet <laughs> exactly and i have no issues handing something to somebody in person that's not a problem i even said that to jeremiah if you can make it to canada or i'll make it to the border you know and you make it to the border and we'll sit and have a lunch or something and i'll give you your clock <laughs> I'm literally an hour from the border. Yeah, you're not far, eh? Ooh. Yeah, we all can meet up for a conference someday. You know what? I'm into that. But my issue is, is I can't really cross the border. My past, I wasn't a... Uh, when I was a kid, I made bad decisions. So I hear you on that, man. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I think What's, we all have. What's that? I, said, I think we all have. 
Yeah, yeah. I n- I never used any violence. I'm not like that. I never did any crazy robberies or whatever. But you know, buy and sell stuff got me into trouble. <laughs> but that's what you do when you're a kid. You you get into trouble, you learn, right? Oh yeah, crazy. Yeah. But yeah, so that's a bit of the stuff that I've been working on for the last like. Uh, let's see. I think I started about. 18 years ago on all this. This isn't something I started as a kid. This is something that uh, after I became disabled, I sort of got into. So, so there you go. See, I did the same thing. Yeah. So maybe, well, you can have a hobby, Mike, right? Oh, and then sorry. go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, no. I was just going to uh, chime in. Uh, Mike does. Uh, he said he can get on in about an hour, if that's cool with everybody. He was going to help me with the uh, Bedini circuit. I was hoping that you all could help me. Um, find the uh, put together a quick materials list for their phase two testing. Um, yeah. in a little bit here. Well, let him help you with his version of the yeah, he, yeah, he put together the circuit, so I, I'd rather him and um, yeah, you should have one on one with him and do it because uh, I, yeah, you know, without anybody chiming in, but no, uh, are you, are you gonna throw together a quick presentation? No, <clears throat> I, no, I'm not, I'm not ready, but. Oh, okay. Offer. Uh, yeah, no problem. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I gotta make you wait. You gave yeah. us some pretty good no, teasers. Were... Gave no. us some pretty good teasers. No, he did. Thank you for that. It's just yeah, I've been waiting, and I can't explain what's going on in this club more than what I already did. I, I don't want to give anybody any more information. Yeah, I know more what's going on, and yeah. it's killing me I not to talk do. about it. I know you do. <laughs> That's why I said we got to do a private Zoom one day. <laughs> There's some things I can tell you too, but there I don't I don't like to release everything because this system threw me for a loop when I discovered it, and I've been mapping it ever since. I've been mapping it for about 12, 13 years, somewhere around there. Yeah, you know, somewhere around there. When I got to talk to John Bedini and Thomas Bearden at once. That was when I first discovered it. it was like a week wait, before. Wait, 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 wait! You got to talk to to Bedini and Tom Bearden at the same time. Yeah, you know what happened? They were both at this conference, and wow. uh, who was it that was doing it? They did a radio. It was oh, come on, brain. Uh, he's very well known. He does all. Thank you, Art, Art Bell. Bell. Oh, he he really? was complaining at one too. time because he did an interview with uh, John Bedini and then he did an interview with Thomas Bearden and he made a joke how he could never get the two of them together in the same room because he wanted to do an interview with both of them. Then he there was this conference going on and it was like across the street from our bells or something like that and he pulled them in for a radio interview and they had a call-in special. So I called in and I got to ask a question. Wow. That's how I got to talk. It was one question, but I said to him, I said, and I didn't tell him I've done experiments. I, I just wanted to keep it vague. But I asked him, I said, okay, so if you could come up with a system that resonates with, say, cesium-123 uh, or whatever it is, and it resonates. Thank you. And it resonates at the uh, same frequency and you're able to take the energy out at that resonant frequency so that it lowers down to a different resonant frequency, are you not changing it into your daughter product? And if you could do that, is that not what we're searching for? And Thomas Bearden and John both laughed at me. I took it as a, not as an insult, but as a, a compliment. And they said, well, what was it? It was Thomas Bearden that said, he says, well, son, if you could do that, we'd all be out of a job and you'd have the Holy Grail sitting in your hand. And they both. Yeah. Laugh. Yeah. Because they know that's the Holy Grail of physics. Is that the Holy Grail of physics? I don't know. Pardon me if I say this, then I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that the whole oh. Holy Grail of physics was what the rodent coil represented. But, you know, I could be wrong. Well, you know what? If you can build a magnetic field in the center of your open core system, 
Mm -hmm. and still have a magnetic field on the outside of your system because you're pushing that excess energy to it and mm. you collect that excess energy and burn it in a load, you'd be pulling the energy from the whatever sitting in the center core at whatever frequency it's at, at whatever energy level it's at. And you'd be See, able that to- makes sense. Level, That makes sense. That makes sense. When uh, when I have the neodymium sphere vibrating outside of the donut and it's resonating with the Schumann resonance because it's, you know, it's resonating with the, the earth, ma earth magnetic uh, magnetosphere, right? Yeah. So it's affecting it outside of the condensed vortex where it should be affected. That that explanation makes more sense than anything I've ever heard. <laughs> you, so, you, go ahead. You need a coil inside of that coil. Ah, if so my you want, coil is. That, yeah, if if you want some more cool experiments, when you build your next one, run a coil through the center so that you tap into it. I'm telling you, it change your life. So, like I do have a coil. coil. Yeah, like, okay, so I have a coil inside a coil. They're wrapped by firely. They're interwoven. But do you mean, like, a separate third coil in the center no, of the coil? I, I, I'm saying that uh, rodent coil yeah. needs oh. a center coil inside of the field of the round part, right? Yeah. And you can do cool experiments with Tesla coils hooked to that. You could do it with, you know, just a magnetic coil. You can keep everything internal. Guy, I'm telling you, field inside of a field is an amazing study in itself. Yeah, that's uh, that's part of the system that works in, in that big coil that you see. It's a field inside of a field. I actually get, and I don't know if this is normal or not. I never asked anyone about it because I really don't know. But when it comes to thermodynamics, usually the center of whatever's hottest is in the center and then it's cooler on the outside, right? So in my coil, if I'm running a high load on it, it'll get hot in the open core. And I can check that out with a laser thermometer or just a, a regular digital thermometer. And then on the outside of the coil, it's all the same temperature all the way around, but it's like four to five degrees cooler. Wow. It's almost cold energy on the outside. Yeah. Why the heat's on the inside. Yes. Or it's or is it's that the, Yeah. So it, for, is for that what is you're that, doing? It is. Yeah. Do you do you think that's like a byproduct of in, inducing <laughs> this uh, aether energy or radiant energy that that cold electricity? I think the only way that radiant energy or cold electricity can occur is if you form a pinch or a, a compression, yeah. so that you can have charge compression, right? And that right. happen in the center of the open core. Right, you pinch that. Uh, you pinch that pole. Yeah, yeah, right in the center. I, there's actually a spot in the center of that coil that's a null zone. Now you can take mm. the magnet and you pulse it at 7.83 hertz, and it'll hop and spin and it'll go all the way around the coil, right? But if yeah. you put it in the in the uh, open core, just close to the coil, it'll hop and spin and jump around. But if you put it right in the center, very center, it won't move. There's a null zone there. Right, like the eye of the hurricane, right? Yeah, it holds whatever is. So is is, is yeah. that the point where the neodymium sphere would kind of levitate if it's the right uh, shape and size? Actually, you know what? That's funny that you say that because the last magnet that I made levitate in there was uh, it looked more like a disc, mm -hmm. and it would attach itself to the inside core, but I can tap it and it would roll around the core, like. Uh it's on one I of my to, I have to assume that the different shapes of coils that we're, we're making have to uh, have different complementary field geometries for the magnets they that are do. inside. Get right? up on that. Well, that's why I built the 175 of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to I figure you, out how that works, right? <laughs> yeah, like, he's, the, he's the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but... I, I, I blew up a lot of stuff and I electrocuted myself a lot. Don't kid yourself. But yeah, I this, built a lot of different This is parts. cool. And I get to talk to you, both of you guys. Like, so, I, I got two amazing genius inventors, right? <laughs> two Tesla wow. coils pointed at each other, put a light in the middle, makes a dead spot. Really? So multiply the coils huh. and you're going to get the same thing. 
That's yeah. why when they talked about Terrence Howard in the Saturn project, that's why it clicks and makes sense because there's going to be a spot that your actual uh, center is. There is. Awesome. And then everything rotates around it. That's, mm. I kind of wonder if that's actually where you could travel between planets without actually affecting your mass or your speed. Literally almost like uh, teleportation from point to point, right? If there's a null zone there and there's a null zone here and you can match the frequency of that null zone of that planet, I don't know. It's just a thought, right? I kind of wonder. Well, that goes into uh, uh, Victor... Uh, uh, Schauberger? Schauberger. When he did his uh, air experiment where he's rotating the field and then he travels down the center where there is no inertia then he can use whatever force pulls him through it. He actually made a system that floated, but nobody believed him. His assistant seen it, many people seen it, but he actually made, uh, it, you couldn't call it levitation because it worked on the way air flowed, but it literally floated. It was really crazy. Oh, check this out. In the documentary right, that we've all seen, we see his son talk about the energy that he was producing. And he kept saying it didn't have enough current in it, so they couldn't use it as an energy source. What he didn't realize was the water itself, the way it was moving. So coils in the center, the water is rotating just like this. Just like it would in that rotten coil as a flow of energy. Oh, wow. What documentary is this? This is, uh, uh, oh, man, it's getting late. What was his name? Victor Schauberger. Schauberger, yeah. So it was sort of like towards the end of the documentary, right after they talk about his device and the and the chamber it created. Right after that, he does a brief, I, I want to say it's like a minute, maybe two, on this energy. The crazier thing is, is the exact same energy we're playing with, with very low amps and very high voltages in order to produce this, in order to get that water itself to move in that direction. <coughs> I'm taking the oxygen in the water and he's just polarizing or charging it to get the field. Wow. See, and I think one of the keys to this energy is a coil system that is by filer and you capture the back EMF faster than, I don't even know how to explain that without sounding too woo. But when you turn it on and it fills the whole coil with energy in every piece of copper and you shut it off really fast, that energy all goes into the back EMF. Yes. By the, by the time it's filled up the back EMF and you flip the switch on, fill the primary, they're butting up against each other and creating a ton of current and you're releasing one and filling the other, kind of like breathing. Right? But don't you have to design the circuit so it shuts down as fast as possible? Yeah. Oh. I, I fire my stuff at 1% duty cycle sometimes. Tesla's Colorado notes, he has a circuit in there, which is a power circuit. So it'll take and use the excess energy and loop it in the system in order mm -hmm. to use it again. So it switches when you go from the voltage is needed to run the Tesla coil to a lower voltage, and then it brings it out of your circuit. So you mm -hmm. can use all that energy with that circuit. Oh, wow. The, there is a guy out there by the name of Joel Legacy. Big shout out, Joel, if you're listening, you rock. And he had a dream. I'm um, just looking for the paper right now. I, I'm old school. I write it down on, on paper, right? Because then that way nobody can take it. <laughs> uh, you have to come to my house then, and good luck with that one. Um, yeah, so here it is. He comes up with this, he has a dream and, and he comes up with a circuit called Bedini's Reactive DC Magnetic Oscillator. And I tried it and it works. And I was able to feed my back EMF back into the front part of the circuit and the circuit um, energized even, I'd say one, maybe 30% more. It didn't, it didn't complete it. Like it wasn't running on its own, but the trigger that I was using the power went way down. I think I was using 
maybe a hundred milliamps to start. And then when I was done, it was like 20 milliamps or something. So it was close. It was close to running itself being just a resonator from this one circuit. Uh, I'm going to do a video on it and show it. It's pretty I neat. I sure hope so. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, I just wonder if me closed looping it, but again, it doesn't run itself. So it's not really a closed loop at that point. I just wonder if it would, you know, if I had a large enough capacitor bank in there or something. I don't know. Just a thought. But I'll show you this circuit. It's really neat. And Joel, if you're listening, it worked. Okay. Your dream circuit worked. <laughs> there, I had to say that. Yeah. You know, I always talk about anchor watt and then Tesla coils. Okay. So hear me out. And I think I said this last time, uh, Benefactor, we're on together. If you took a Tesla coil that's an out, Put coil, put it in the center. Just okay. the same configuration as anchor Y. Every tower put a receiving coil. So you got four that go on the inner part, and then you got another four, I think it's eight on the outer part. So if you simply take in between those and you make a salt water battery, you can then absorb all of the energy from that resonating coil, dump in 10 times the energy into the batteries and run a load off of it and have zero problems. Oh, that's interesting. It's like they drew a map in the layout of how they build things. And as long as you can put it to what you know how to work on, it makes it easier. So you not only get a loop for the system, you have energy coming out. You're not wrong. You're not wrong at all. That's, that's really interesting. Because... Everything comes in. That's what people don't understand. It's receiving coal. It's receiving energy, right? Yeah. Well, if you put an immediate load on it, it destroys it. But if you run it into something that can hold capacitance, then it saves it. And no matter which one you run, you can't pull enough out to be more than what you're putting in. Yeah, That's actually, crazy. there's a way of, uh, uh, you know how most people, they come up with like that high voltage they call it scalar, and, and they mm. can't convert it to real power, right? Well, if you use two capacitors back-to-back, -back, you can. It converts it right back to regular power because that huh. static field goes in, polarizes. You depolarize it or swap it back out with having your, your capacitors back-to-back, -back, and then you pull it out. So yeah. what? They could just detect it with their multimeters or whatever? Uh, after the capacitors, yeah. But I'm saying, like before, they're able to utilize it. They're they're just able to. Yeah, you pick it. it up with your multimeter, but it won't go into like uh, uh, a load. A load, you can't do anything yeah. with it. Well, if you run it right. through capacitors back to back, you can because mm. it, it builds uh, current as you're going back to back from that capacitor, and of course, your system itself. Huh? Do the capacitors have to be exactly the same? <laughs> yes, they do, and they have to be. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not polarized, <laughs> but uh, uh, not ACDC. I, I'm, I'm using the wrong term. I know I am. I'm just kind of brain dead. It's getting kind of late from my head. I got so much to do today. <laughs> I <laughs> okay. get so much today, and I got still a few things to do before I go to bed. So, Silver get Cart says, Anchor Watt battery, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of things out there. I I, the Anchor Watt is my personal favorite ancient ruin. Uh, I, I love Anchor Watt. Everything about it is so beautiful. It was Anchor Watt connected to that island with the heads. The Easter Island? Easter Island, yeah. Didn't Wasn't it sitting know. on the same ley line? I don't know. That'd be fascinating, though. Let's see. Let's, let us look. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> wonder. You know what? I'd love to take my gravity flyer out to Giant Rock and see what it does out there. Oh, yeah. That, I, I don't live too far from it. So, you know what I mean? It's like maybe a couple hours from my house. I might try oh, wow. it. You should try it. Get it on video. <laughs> I'd like to go in the Integratron, but I don't want anything to do with the hippies. and the. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, apparently it was taken over by bikers, and it's like you can't even get close to it now. Now, if I got rich, I would buy that thing and produce, you know, the fields that's supposed to go into it and make it right. 
for sure. Absolutely. If we can all we can all sit out there and have ourselves a glass of lemonade or something, you know what I mean? Damn like people straight. running through it. I would love to build something similar with a, a slightly different system, but on the same principle. Yeah. I kind of wonder if it would help people. Crypto says Anchor Watt has a floating megalith island in its lake. Ooh. Interesting. That is, yeah, that just blew my mind. I Thank never you. did that. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Hey, yeah. Crypto, how do I get on that show where you guys talk about ancient sites, man? That's that's always fascinating to me. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Yeah, that's absolutely killer. Yeah. So uh, I'll bring up one more thing, and then I'm going to kind of bail on you guys, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's um, getting almost to the three-hour mark, so yeah. Go do ahead. you guys know what the PMH is? Ed Lead, yeah, permanent. Uh, it's the thing that Ed Lead Scallon came up with. Lots of people have done uh, videos on it. If you look at Jason Rebelli, even last year he was doing experiments on it. So the PMH, it's with the horseshoe. And then the two copper coils, they're counterwound, okay? So, uh, and when you energize it, it you put up, how do I explain this? Okay, so you take a piece of metal and you put it underneath the horseshoe and you energize the two or the line and it becomes magnetic and it will sit there in a closed loop for 50, 60, 100 years, they say. So it's like a perpetual magnetic loop, but you can't do anything with it. You can't make power from it or whatever, right? So Jason Verbelli, like I just made a video on this, but I, I didn't show a demo. Jason Verbelli did a video and he shows how when you energize the horseshoe and then de-energize it, it will light a light because that magnetic turns into electric. And he's like tapping with a nine volt battery and he can get it to pulse, but he can't get it to stay on. He's like, if I just had a variable switcher and there was a, uh, somebody that I watch called Tristan McNabb and he pulled the little washing machine motor apart. That's the Jaron Morin device. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the Jaron Morin device in its pieces, it's a PMH with a spinning magnet on the end so that it has a variable switching device. It's literally a magnetic perpetual motion holder. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely butchering that. But if you look at the way it's built, it's literally a PMH with moving parts. It blew my mind. Wow. Somebody figured out how to take the PMH, put it into a device, and then put it in a washing machine. I told no one. Because <laughs> the coils on this thing are counterwound. One's clockwise, one's the other, counterclockwise. It's one wire, and yeah. then it's got a capacitor that connects it. And all you do is spin the magnet on it, and you're creating power. Like, I think Mike Faraday was getting 40 watts for free. I could be wrong on that. But yeah, I had a couple of those in my garage. I worked with them like four years ago, I think it was. Yeah, so if you look at the way the coils are, and you look at the way the steel is, the steel is literally shaped like a horseshoe. And the coils are wound like a PMH. So hmm. it it's just it, mind-blowing. I, I thought, I can't believe somebody came up with that. And nobody well, actually saw it. If you take the horseshoe-shaped coil and you change the actual places where the, the uh, windings go, yeah, you can actually change that to be north or south when it comes out of the bottom. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. See, there you go. It, it, and that's what happens at the PMH, too. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so cool. I love finding out stuff like that. It's just, you know, science is awesome. I love yeah, to learn. They have an yeah. old-time video on it. I'll find it. I'll send it to you, man. It's Definitely. I'll watch it for sure. For sure. That's awesome. The, all that science, you know what? My whole goal in life is to learn one new thing a day. That's my go. joy. Yeah. That's why I got into the science. Because I'm learning stuff. Wait. I got notes I got to write down. I'm learning so much stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
So much learning, but I mean, it's a lot to take in, but at the same time, <clears throat> I feel like it's helped me understand like so much more, not, not only in science, but in, in understanding life in general. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have to agree. Kind of the way it works, right? Science, yeah. life, right? I don't know. I guess physics, it's, it's all part of it. Philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. But academia loves to separate that so that they can get their money for teaching you by each subject. And then they keep the subject separated so that you don't put all the pieces together. Mm. Right? But we're putting the pieces together right here on the show, gentlemen. They, they should have just <laughs> offered physics instead of English when we got to high school. Yeah. Because at that point, we can all read and spell. That doesn't need to be expanded. What needs to be expanded is the physics. Absolutely. And the way that physics works and the way that it's taught, it yeah. should be fun, not so dry and dusty as a desert fart. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I, I did the class, man, I we would light it up every once in a while with vultures. You keep <laughs> that whole thing excitable. There you go. You know it. <laughs> That's the way to teach. You want to make people smile. You want to make people think and go, right. what was he doing there? You know? Hey, That's I, how they learn. High voltage tells you a lot more when you get it running, and it shows you its secrets more than low voltage does. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I just started playing with high voltage this last year because even low voltage with these systems I play with are crazy. Because there's things, like I said, I haven't talked about that make me a little nervous. <laughs> yeah. So, no, don't. You should oh, add, a, sorry, add a trigger know. circuit to your thing. You can put in whatever you want. A witch? Yeah. So I had a trigger circuit to my high voltage. So it basically runs the power from the power source in into this trigger circuit that goes just straight over to the ZVS, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the little trigger circuit will allow you to add a 5-volt circuit to it, which you could put in your frequency and duty cycle, and it completely changes your high voltage coming out of your coil. Oh, that's what you were talking about? On your video I was watching today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I seen that today. I was watching going, yeah, you know what? I'm building one of those. <laughs> yeah. Like $10 yeah. worth of parts changes the whole way you see high voltage. Yeah, for sure. I'm building one of those. Because the high voltage I have now is, uh, it's not as controllable as I'd like. I got a neon sign transformer. I got a bunch of those high voltage modules. And I got a, a, a bunch of uh, plasma globe. The hearts from them, right? I had a few break in my time. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you yeah. what. It it tells you a lot about charge. I used to take two flybacks, put them in uh, series, right? Yeah. In order to draw down the amps and bring up the volts. Now with this circuit, I can draw down as many amps as I want, bring up as many volts as I want, along with changing the frequency in it to get myself in that place where I can get the charge. So you got full control. Full control. Oh, that's what they're, I want. They're not hiding it for me, buddy. I got I got this one. You know what I kind of wondered? I kind of wondered if an H-bridge would work in my system. Because I have like a um, by filer and an H-bridge switches the polarity consistently back and forth, right? I kind of wonder if doing that would give it some form of an upward motion. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing it out there we're talking about circuits so it's an interesting idea yeah h bridges are the things they use to run motors right so i kind of wonder i don't know just a thought well I want, i'm building your circuit that's for sure when i heard that full control oh yeah i'm building that <laughs> for sure i actually have a zvs i have the 1800 watt zvs so i gotta change out some of the caps on it but big deal yeah, I was thinking I instead of a 20K ohm resistor, I could just use a uh, potentiometer in there and it'll give me the resistance going up and down that I want. So I could put a 30, uh, you know, like a 30K um, ohm uh, potentiometer in there. And now I can change that as well on the resistance end of it to change the circuit even more. That's fine tuning right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I might try that after you try. 
<laughs> I'm gonna build the first circuit first. <laughs> oh, it's gonna, it's gonna. You'll see it immediately. That's what I love about high voltage. As soon as you do it, and you start changing the frequency, you're gonna go. Well, where did all the white go? And then why is this thing not jumping the spark gap anymore? And then you're gonna start to ask yourself. What is really going on here? What did I just do to this thing? Yeah, I can't wait because I, I imagine I'm going to see even more strange anomalies come off the system. Well, it's check it out. You never lose energy. So it had to go wow. somewhere. So my question is, did it go right back into the magnetic coil on the thing? And did it change something of the operation in there with the frequency? And that's the curious thing I have about it. Huh. Interesting thought. Because you don't lose any power and it doesn't back up into the circuit. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, think about that one. It's gotta go somewhere. Somewhere there's an amplification point it's hitting and, and absorbing the energy. There's a, a configuration, like there's four configurations that I can do with this bifiler coil system that changes the aspects of the whole thing. And one of them that I do, uh, when I put a high voltage in it, I get nothing out. Nothing changes. I'm not seeing any voltage. I'm not seeing any resistance, no heat, no nothing. It just goes into the system and disappears somewhere. And I have no idea where. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. I'm going to put a video out on it one day just to show what I'm doing to see if anybody's got any ideas. It's almost like the energy goes dead. Like it's why, why don't you suspend it and then put a pickup coil under it or, or under and over it? Well, I had them beside it, but yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I'll try that. Energy doesn't go away. It's got to go somewhere. Maybe it got focused into a beam rather than on the outside. That's a good That point. would be cool. Yeah, that's a good point. Huh. I'm actually going to write that down as a note right now. Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> well, I got to learn something, man. I, I, yeah, I'd love for that to work. Definitely. Oh, yeah, that's uh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to try that. That's uh, that's a good idea. I never even thought to do that. I don't know why. <laughs> so, gentlemen, it's uh, it's been a long one. It's been awesome. I've dropped a few teasers and um this week or the beginning of next week i'll drop a few more so oh. but we'll keep me on that fishing line okay <laughs> sorry nathan i can't let it all out at once because then people will be bored when it comes to apec right no i get it i get it all right all right guys thank you Matt, for you showing up Jim. did you freeze you. no 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 uh my uh webcam is delayed so <laughs> oh yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah well, until i get for... a new one and and i will get a new one next week or uh actually this week so i got the kio pro it works pretty good yeah what is that i'm gonna look it up right now kia pro kia pro i'm writing that down too because i'm buying one it's buying a setup this week i'm just not sure what to get yet it's, it's on amazon and they have a deal days on the 16th and 17th Oh, yeah. Yeah. Call it? yeah, you'll get it down a lot less. I think they gave me 70% off last time I bought it. Wow. How do you, how do you spell it? I think it's K-Y-O. Oh, K-Y-O. Oh, nice. So it's just the pro model. It's uh, I think it's like $80 or somewhere $80.90 right now. That's worth it. Mm -hmm. And then That's it'll drop it. during the deal days if you wait. That's using now. Second. Nice. And it gives you 1080p. It's the camera I'm using right now. Nice. That's right here. Yeah. Matter awesome. of fact, I bought a second one to put on my experiment so I have two views. So when I start it up again, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to have that. And then I don't know what happened. Something broke in the camera. And now I've only got this one. And it's not the greatest. <laughs> You probably did what I did and run some EM fields around it and just blew it out. <laughs> I'm notorious for that. On one of my lives, I showed it. Out. I filled the capacitor and then I shorted it out. And the uh, short was so strong, the 
the uh, flash was green and it made like gravitational waves in the camera and everything froze. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you're not wrong. That could be what happened. <laughs> Consequences of being a mad scientist, huh? Yeah. Uh, the meters I've blown, I wish I would have kept them, man. I have to fill the box, I'm telling you. It's crazy. All right, gentlemen, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Gerald. I really yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you for coming on. We and appreciate you. Guys you guys have a great night. And, uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Yeah. All right. Later. Bye. All right, Ben. I think we should end it here, man. We did. We got a very cool thing today. What do you yeah. think we do this again next Monday? Yeah, that sounds like a good, we'll have a think tank Monday. How's there that? There you go. Nice. We'll try to set um, it up at the same time, give everybody some time to, uh, you know, I'll set it up in the stream so that everybody yes. knows we're here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And I wanted to get Mike on, but it looks like he's not here. So, yeah. Like you said, we, we've been going on how long? Uh, uh, it's three hours, 14 minutes. Yeah, oh yeah, mine crashed, so it's gonna be lower. But uh yeah, we've been going on for a while and I gotta get to bed because I work tomorrow. So <laughs> but uh um, right, yeah. we'll set it up for next week. We'll do it on a Monday. Sounds good. And then we'll invite whoever you guys want. You know what I mean? Crypto, you're always welcome. We'll send you the email. Yep, yep. And uh I Mike, if you're watching, I still would like you to email me. Um putting my email in the chat right now. So you can email me and we can do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, so I can order these parts real quick. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to end the stream, guys. I really appreciate uh, everybody. I really appreciate you from for doing this, Nathan. Uh, it, it's really cool of you. So uh, <laughs> right on, I'll see you next I, Monday. <laughs> I had a great time, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Have a good night.